This video was brought to you by Blinkist. Hello friends, my name is JJ. So I'm very interested in the different cultures of the world, and one of my favorite cultural phenomena is what they call civic rituals. A civic ritual is a tradition we do to celebrate citizenship, as opposed to, say, religion or something like that. And one of the best examples of this are the traditions that we have developed around our elections, which of course are one of the most important events that citizens of any country can participate in. In the good old USA, for example, stickers have become a very traditionalized part of the US voting process. Specifically these little I voted stickers. This is one of those traditions where no one knows exactly when or where it started, but most figure it was probably sometime in the 1980s. And they have since risen to become one of the most beloved ways for Americans to self-righteously guilt and shame one another. This oval-shaped one here tends to be the most traditional design, and there are a bunch of rival companies that all claim to have invented it. But as Vox ably documented in a 2016 story, American I Voted stickers also tend to vary a lot from state to state and even city to city. In Rochester, New York, the sticker tradition has evolved into a whole other election day tradition, putting stickers on the grave of Susan B. Anthony. Susan B. Anthony, of course, being an early 20th century activist, very much associated with getting American women the right to vote. I am assured that this tradition is, in fact, respectful of her. Now, here is an American election tradition that you might not know about if you live in a big city. Many smaller towns in the US host election day suppers in which you can show up on election day to some public place and get a very cheap or free meal. These are usually hosted by churches or like social clubs like the Elks or the Masons and are supposed to symbolize a sort of coming together of the community after a very politically contentious election season. Many of these suppers have been running for decades, in some cases a half century or more, and as a result, they tend to serve very old-fashioned and in some cases vaguely ethnic traditional American foods, like spaghetti and meatballs, sauerkraut, chili, turkey, or pancakes. If you're an American and have ever been to one of these things, please let me know. I think it would be fun to compile a full menu of American democracy foods. And speaking of democracy foods, the Australians have a very similar tradition, but it's a lot more mainstream and way more Aussie-fied. Their big ritual is to have a barbecue on election day, often right at the polling place. It's often used as an opportunity for the sort of places that host voting, like schools or community centers, to host little same-day fundraisers. You can buy lots of fun, traditional Australian foods at these things, like bacon and egg sandwiches or some of those weird Australian cakes. But the most traditional thing to get is a hot dog, which in upside-down Australian world consists of a sausage on a piece of bread with tomato sauce and onions. And instead of hot dogs, they've started calling these things democracy sausages which was declared the official Australian word of the year in 2016. This association between sausages and voting has become so entrenched in Australian culture that on Twitter, their little I voted hashtag emoji thing is literally a hot dog on toast. But not all democracy traditions are just for voters. The politicians have plenty of them too. For example, check out this thing. The Japanese call it a Daruma doll. This one is plush, but the traditional ones are made out of paper mache. In Japan, Daruma dolls are for making wishes, and this is how it works. When you decide what you want, you color in one of the eyes. And then when you get what you want, you color in the other eye too. This is a very well entrenched Japanese wish making tradition, kind of like blowing out the candles on a birthday cake. And as a result, during Japanese elections, their politicians have started this tradition of kicking off their campaign by hosting a photo op in which they color in one of the eyes of a giant Daruma. And then if things go well on election night, they have a second photo op in which they color in the other eye. And then I assume they just throw it in the trash because honestly, who needs a giant creepy man blob doll? In the United Kingdom, their big political tradition is these things, which we would just call ribbons, but they call by the grander name rosettes. For over a hundred years, British politicians and their various hangers-on have worn rosettes when they're out campaigning. It's basically just a fancier version of the classical American campaign button, 
from which this tradition probably evolved. British rosettes are all color coordinated, so it's very easy to tell who's supporting who. Red is for Labour, blue is for Conservative, yellow is for Liberal Democrats, and turquoise is for whatever Nigel Farage is. Now, just as a personal aside, I want to note that I tried very hard to obtain a rosette so I could use it as a prop in this video. I personally think it is a little bit more fun when I have tactile objects to wave around rather than just showing boring stock photos. But I went all over the place and couldn't find anywhere that sold them. And then eventually I went to this trophy store and the woman who worked there said that in all of southern British Columbia, there was only one guy who makes them. And he's a 70 year old man who sews them by hand in his backyard and he needs at least two weeks of notice, blah, blah, blah. So in the end, the closest thing I could find was this little cheap one I bought at the dollar store. It says birthday girl. The point is, you can hopefully see that rosettes are a somewhat less culturally relevant object here in Canada than they are in Great Britain. Anyway, the British politicians will also wear their ribbons when they do that other great tradition of British democracy, the public vote count. At the end of a British election, the results of every parliamentary riding is read out in public often in a school gymnasium or some place like that. And all the candidates will stand together on stage as they listen to the results. It is actually quite an exhausting process since the Brits are notoriously slow at counting votes, meaning these ceremonies are often taking place at like 3 a.m. In recent years, it has also become a beloved British tradition for crazy people in costumes to photobomb these ceremonies, especially in the writings of prominent politicians where the ceremony is likely to be aired live on TV. The way you do this is by registering to run as a candidate in one of these constituencies, which guarantees you a spot on the stage on election night, even if you get like no votes. Recent British elections have accordingly featured candidates such as Elmo, Mr. Fishstick, and of course everyone's favorite, Lord Buckethead. In case you are wondering, it costs $600 to register to run as a candidate in a British parliamentary election. $600 well spent. A somewhat less grating British democracy tradition is dog photos. This is one that has arisen more recently in the age of social media. Basically, on British election day, everyone brings their doggos with them to the voting place and then posts photos of them on social media using the hashtag dogs at polling stations. Supposedly, this tradition arose out of boredom with the lack of news on voting day in the UK. You see, Britain has very strict laws that prohibit the media from broadcasting anything that could be seen as influencing the vote while the polls are still open, which means that the press can't really report on anything political during the biggest political day of the year. And as we all know, during a slow news day, there is nothing the press loves more than just regurgitating something that's going on on social media. But it's not all smiles. Look, the BBC had to censor this photo of a dog because he was wearing a rosette. Now the long and painful slog of campaigning for office is something that is quite rich in tradition in a lot of countries as well. For example, in a lot of places, there is often some sort of high profile event that all of the major political candidates are supposed to attend, some sort of traditional festival or party or something. For example, during US presidential elections, they have this increasingly awkward thing called the Al Smith dinner. It's this extraordinarily formal white tie banquet where both major candidates are expected to show up and basically do like 15 minutes of stand-up comedy in front of some of New York City's wealthiest elite. This is an impressive crowd, the haves and the have-mores. <laughs> Some people call you the elite. I call you my base. <laughs> it's pretty fun to imagine Bernie Sanders doing this, eh? And then, of course, there is the tradition of campaign merch. Now, where I come from, candidates usually just try to raise awareness of themselves using road signs and posters and TV ads. And, of course, these obnoxious flyer things that they stuff in your mail slot. But in some countries, they go way beyond any of this. So here is a big crate of stuff that one of my friends sent me from Taiwan from their recent general election. In Taiwan, it is apparently traditional for their politicians to flood the country with a truly insane assortment of branded campaign merchandise, including flags, scarves, hats, fans, bottled water, Kleenex, soap, coasters, anti-coronavirus face masks, and even dolls. I say Taiwanese sovereignty is here to stay. 
And I say Chiang Kai-shek's dream of a united China must never be abandoned. So they say it was the French who first came up with the idea of politicians publishing books during election campaigns. This was supposedly because the uber-sophisticated French would never put up with a politician who did not project himself as being a intellectual statesman with the ability to think and analyze. But these days, politicians all over the world have embraced the tradition of the campaign memoir, though I suspect most do not put nearly as much effort into it as the French. I mean, here in Canada, I feel like it is more or less just completely taken for granted that any campaign memoir will be obviously ghostwritten, painfully politically correct, and offer no real insight at all into the mind of the politician who supposedly wrote it. So while President Macron's book was a bestseller in France, Justin Trudeau's book wound up in the bargain bin almost immediately. Which brings us to today's video sponsor, Blinkist. Let's say you're interested in reading a politician's campaign memoir, but aren't sure if it will be a genuinely revealing window into their personal political philosophy, or just something one of their interns slapped together from snippets of their old speeches and Facebook updates. Well, here is where Blinkist comes in. Blinkist is a very cool app that summarizes popular nonfiction books both in text and through podcast-style audio recordings. It lets you get through even the longest book in only about 15 minutes. This is not only a good way to get the gist of a book in a hurry, but it is also a good way to know if the full book is something that is worth reading in full. So for instance, you could listen to the Blinkist summary of President Trump's 2016 campaign memoir, Crippled America, or the one Hillary Clinton co-wrote with her vice presidential candidate Tim Kaine, entitled Stronger Together. Something tells me that 15 minutes will probably be enough time to spend with these two. Or you might want to check out some political autobiographies that have a slightly higher reputation, like the memoirs of Nelson Mandela, or Gandhi. Anyway, click on the link in the thing below to get one week free unlimited access to Blinkist to Try it out for yourself. You can also get 25% off if you decide you want to have a full membership. So, as is often the case with videos like this, I want to put out the call to you, my wonderfully international audience, if you guys have any more examples. Are there any weird traditions associated with voting or campaigning where you live? Let me know in the thing below. Do not forget to like and subscribe, and I will see you all next week.